All right, now we're going to move on to what we're trying to discuss today, which is magnetism. We'll, we'll try to see how it's similar and different to electric field and force. So remember that charges create electric fields, and electric fields generate forces on test charges. So a source charge creates the electric field, which generates the force on the test charge. Remember that it's arbitrary who we think of as the source. If we wanted to, we could think of this as a source charge creating a different electric field that's exerting a force on this as a test charge. But usually, you're only going to focus on one thing as the source and one thing as the test charge. So what generates electric fields? Electric charges generate electric fields. So now we need to learn what generates magnetic fields. Well, it's moving charges that create magnetic fields. Any type of charge would create an electric field, but only moving charges create magnetic fields. And again, I would call these the source charges because they're creating the magnetic field. Uh, and I kind of let the cat out of the bag as to what is the symbol for a magnetic field. So we're going to use capital B as the symbol for a magnetic field. We can't use F because that's already being used for force. And M is being used for mass, so I don't know what the logic is behind using B, but we're going to use capital B for magnetic field. That's a very standard. Symbol. Uh, now remember that we would never talk about the electric field that is exerted on a charge, because electric fields are not exerted on charges. Electric fields are properties of space. We would talk about the electric field at a point in space. Well, the same thing goes for a magnetic field. You talk about the magnetic field at a point in space. The magnetic field at a point in space has nothing to do with any charges that might be at that particular point in space. It's just a property of the space. Why do we care about the magnetic field? Because the magnetic field creates a magnetic force. What would be a good logical symbol to use for magnetic force? F. Right. In general, we use capital F to stand for force. Now again, on the exam, you're likely to see some questions that have both electric fields and magnetic fields. Well, if there's both electric and magnetic fields, you can use this to symbolize the electric field and this to symbolize the magnetic. But for today, I think we'll just stick to magnetic fields, so I'll leave off the subscripts. Okay. What would be a good unit for magnetic force? Newton. Because it's a force. And would the magnetic force be a vector or a scalar? A vector. Because it's a force. Now we have to learn what the units are for magnetic field. Well, um, we haven't had a chance to talk about this yet, but you might have remembered your instructor talking about it a little in lecture. I don't know. Do you happen to remember a unit for a magnetic field? This would be the Tesla. Oh, I heard that. Okay. okay. Has your instructor started talking about magnetism yet? Yeah. All right. Well, unfortunately, not some instructors don't emphasize units as much as me. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, anyway, I think that that is really important. So we'll learn that this is the Tesla. Okay. Uh, this is named after uh, Nikola Tesla, who's a uh, Czech scientist. I'm sure that uh, he or his family were thrilled to learn that the unit for magnetic field was named after him. But uh, if so, he would have been really disappointed, because in my experience, no one can remember that this is the unit for magnetic field. So we'll try to do honor to uh, Nikola's uh, memory and remember that this is the unit for magnetic field, the Tesla. Because uh, I'm sure he accomplished great things to earn getting this unit named after him. So uh, let's see. Um, so logically speaking, would we expect this to be a vector or a scalar? because it's going to be determining the magnetic force. So it kind of makes sense that it should be a vector, because the force is a vector. All right, and the key thing I want to emphasize is the analogy between this flow chart and this flow chart. Just as source charges create electric fields which generate electric forces, moving charges create magnetic fields, and those exert magnetic forces. Now, who can feel a magnetic force? Well, the magnetic force is felt by a moving test charge. So that's a key difference between electric force and magnetic force. The charges here don't have to be moving. Um, but these charges have to be moving. Only moving charges create magnetic fields. And only moving charges can feel magnetic forces. Mm -hmm. Something you might see on the test is they might give you a problem and ask, is there an electric force? Is there a magnetic force? Well, for an electric force, you just look for a charge. But for a magnetic force, you have to look for moving charges. Okay. 
Now, what, what are the different forms that moving charges can take? Well, obviously, you could just have a single charge that's moving, like, say, a moving electron. However, much more common in this class would be to be dealing with current. Obviously, current is made out of a whole steady stream of moving charges. So for your practical purposes for this course, this will usually actually be a current. We would call that the source current, because it's the source of the magnetic field. Also, we know from common sense that you can also create magnetic fields with magnets, right? Like your refrigerator magnets. Now, it turns out that the way magnets work, the magnetism of a magnet actually comes from subatomic moving charges. At the subatomic level, charges are moving in the magnet in such a way to create the magnetic field. So it really is true that the basic source of magnetic fields is moving charges. Um, in an introductory class like this, you're actually not very likely to see exam questions about magnets. So we're going to focus not on that, but on currents. That's what your exam is going to focus on. How about who can feel magnetic force? Well, again, a moving charge could feel the magnetic force. Notice that we, don't, we call the thing that's feeling the force the test charge. There isn't really a great name for this, but sometimes these are called test charges, and we'll always call this the test charge. This is the thing that's feeling the magnetic force. Mm -hmm. So for example, a moving electron could feel a magnetic, a magnetic force. Something else that could feel a magnetic force, again, is a current, because that's a whole stream of moving charges. Mm -hmm. And that's also going to be important in this class. You can see exam questions about either isolated charges here or currents here. We know from common sense that a magnet can feel a magnetic force. One magnet can exert a force on another magnet, or even just magnetic materials. For example, if you hold iron close to a magnet, it'll feel a magnetic force. And again, at the subatomic level, that's because it has moving charges. Uh, but again, we're not going to focus too much on magnets. We're going to focus on charges, and, um, discrete charges, and on current. All right, well, I gave you a handout that summarizes the flow chart for electric field and electric force, so it would be logical to have a handout for a magnetic field and magnetic force. Sure. Okay. So what is our, our goal today here? Well, our goal is basically to talk about the stuff that's on top and the bottom of the arrows there. If you look at that, just to take a brief overview, notice that on top of each arrow I discuss how to figure out the directions of the field and force, mm -hmm. just like on the electric field and force handout. And below the arrows, I talk about how to find the magnitudes of the electric field and force. And there's really two, two sides of this. There's this left-hand arrow and the right-hand arrow. So our job today is to learn four things. We have to learn how to figure out these directions and these directions, these magnitudes, and these magnitudes. That is, we have to figure out the directions and magnitudes when you're working with source charges. And we have to learn how to figure out the directions and magnitudes when you're moving with test charges. Remember, the source charge is something that's generating the field, and the test charge is something that's feeling the force from the field. Well, let's see. I think your textbook actually starts with these ideas. So maybe we'll start with this as well. Now, it's going to be very important now to always write down the direction of any vector we're talking about. So it's easy to show when something is up or down or right or left. But when you're working with magnetism, you have to work in three dimensions. Magnetism problems are always three-dimensional. So we always have to also work with vectors that can be coming into the page or out of the page. So we have to uh, invent some new symbols. The instructor might have used these in class. This symbol means out of the page, and this symbol means into the page. Uh, unfortunately, students sometimes mix these up, but there's a good mnemonic to tell the difference. You should imagine that these, these are like an arrow. Well, if the arrow was coming out of the page, you would just see its tip. So this is like the tip of the arrow coming out of the page towards you. On the other hand, if the arrow was going into the page, you would see its tail feathers. Uh, well, these are an artistic representation of the tail feathers here, this little X. So if you see the X, that's like the tail feathers of the arrow moving away from you into the page. Mm -hmm. And if you see the dot, that's like the tip of the arrow coming out of the page. Mm -hmm. And we're going to need to use all of these symbols on pretty much any magnetism problem, because in magnetism, we're always working in three dimensions. So um, 
The way to figure out directions for magnetism is to use things that are called right-hand rules. So we have to learn this right-hand rule. 